Thanks for having me today. Um, my name is Ronald. I'm the founder of Two Orioles. And today I'm going to be talking about video encoding at scale using the EVE video encoder. But before we talk about EVE, uh, quickly let's talk about Two Orioles. Two Orioles is a New York City based video compression specialist company that I've been working on for the past couple of years. Besides Eve, uh, we are well known for our work on David, the open source AV1 encoder that is hosted by Videolam that you've probably heard of. But here, let's just stick to Eve um, as our subject. So Eve is our commercial VP9 and AV1 encoder. Its key features are that there's a big focus on visual quality, not just good metric numbers. And it's difficult to talk about visual quality uh, in the context of an online conference, but let's try it anyway. So this is uh, the opening scene of Meridian, encoded on the left with Eve AV1 and on the right with LibAOM. And if you look at the lampposts in this image, for example, you will see that uh, the edges between the different parts of the lamppost are much crisper in the Eve AV1 encoded version than in the LibAOM encoded version. Uh, likewise, if you look at the white building, the textured parts of it, they're much sharper and crisper in the EVAV1 encoded version than in the LibAOM encoded version. Likewise, if you look at the flatter parts of the white building, you will see that the noise retention in the EVAV1 encoded version is quite decent, whereas uh, the amount of noise retained in the LibAOM encoded version is a lot less so. And of course, this one was encoded with noise synthesis as part of the LibAOM encodes. So uh, that's what we mean when we talk about visual quality. The numbers shouldn't just be good, but the video encoded by an encoder with good numbers should look good also. Um, initially, our focus was on um, high-end content, so studio-grade content, but more recently, uh, we've gotten interested in getting that to the next billion users also. That means encoding at scale, so low-complexity encoding, uh, and that's what I would like to talk about today. And let's start with EVP9. So uh, VP9 was released in 2013 um, at Google I.O. by uh, me in this presentation. It claimed significant compression gains over H.264, which, which was the video standard that everybody used back then. And since then, it has gotten significant traction with wide support in uh, most industry-wide used tools, uh, such as FFmpeg as well as good support in browsers and in most uh, devices, such as phones or TV. Um, what helps its adoption is that it has uh, less onerous uh, licensing terms than, uh, than uh, its contemporary counterparts, uh, HEVC, where you need to uh, agree to multiple um, patenting, patent licensing deals with uh, various bodies. Whereas for VP9, you can just agree to um, a standard licensing agreement that says you can use this at no cost for as long as you want. The problem with VP9 is that back in the day, there was only one encoder, libvpx. And there were a lot of issues with libvpx. For example, some people thought that its visual quality was not quite as good as what its numbers would suggest. They said that the PSNR was better than X264, but if you looked at it, it wasn't that different. Um, another concern that people brought up was that the VPX was very much optimized for YouTube style use cases, but not for anything else. Um, and then lastly, there were concerns about speed as well. And so, as I mentioned before, for these reasons, we started working on eVP9. And the numbers for eVP9 did look good. So this is a graph that shows on the horizontal axis uh, bit rates and on the vertical axis, video quality, either PSNR or VMAF. And what you can see in these graphs is that at the slowest speed presets, EVP9 is able to match X265 in terms of um, bit rates versus quality trade-off. And it uses significantly less bit rates, so it's shifted to the left, uh, compared to either libvpx or X264, to achieve the same quality, with BD rate differences in PSNR of about 10 or 30%. And if you look at VMAF as a metric, those numbers are even uh, bigger and better. But of course, uh, we want to talk about complexity also. So we need to take runtime into account. And that's what this graph is trying to do. So on the horizontal axis here, you have um, encoding complexity or encoding time, 
where right is slowest and left is fastest. And then on the vertical axis, you have uh, the compression gains that I just mentioned before. And what you see here is that if you compare the EVP9 numbers with libvpx, you see that on the right, at a slower speed preset, they're about the same speed. However, EVP9's quality numbers are much better. At the same time, if you compare using PSNR symmetric x265 with EVP9, you will see that the quality is the same, but EVP9 is twice as fast. And then if you shift further to the left on this, uh, on this graph, you will see that EVP9 consistently beats each of these other encoders in terms of speed versus quality trade-offs. What I've shown here is that EVP9 gives significant compression gains compared to X265, libvpx, or X264, but specifically that um, as you go to faster speed presets, that it gives a better speed quality trade-off than any of these other encoders. It's able to match speeds up to about X265 very fast or X264 medium, and we're currently doing work to make that even faster and fill in the left edge of these curves as well. So next, let's talk about AV1. Uh, so AV1 was released in 2018, and I think of AV1 as sort of an improved version of what VP10 would have been. Uh, that is an overall philosophy that is almost the same as VP9, but much better compression and an alliance that significantly broadens its appeal. A problem with AV1 is that it's earlier in its life cycle, and that basically just means that hardware support is not available everywhere yet. So in some use cases, you rely on software decoding. Fortunately for that, we have David, which I mentioned in the beginning. It's a very well-optimized decoder for both ARM as well as x86. And so it can serve as a temporary placeholder until the hardware support comes along. So let's talk about um, quality and uh, speed then. Uh, so first, if you look at open source encoders, at the slowest speed presets, so in this curve that's on the right, um, we typically find that libaom gives the best results. Um, but then as you shift in this curve to the left, SVT AV1 tends to overtake it um, and gives a better speed quality trade-off uh, at the faster sp uh, speed presets. Uh, however, EVE AV1 is significantly better than both of these encoders at uh, almost all speed presets using PSNR or all speed presets using VMAF as a metric. The problem here is that you have to look at the scale of the horizontal axis. So uh, the 264, 265, and VP9 graphs that I showed earlier, uh, the unit of the horizontal axis was 0.1 second of frame to 5 second of frame in terms of encoding complexity. And here we're talking about 0.5 to 50. So the slowest speed presets really are 10 times um, as costly to do. And so it's really important to combine them together. And that's what this graph is trying to do here. So this is basically everything combined together. And what you will see here is that you do get the 20 or 30% compression gains if you use AV1. But it's it's uh, it, it's a lot more expensive, and that as you go to the left, uh, there are still compression gains, but the fastest speed presets, so X two six four medium or fast, or X two six five very fast, they don't really exist yet in AV one encoders. Um, that's in progress, and so you should you should expect that to exist over the course of the next months or year. But for now, that's still um, to be done. So. What I've shown here is that EVE is able to provide low complexity encoding results that in speed match X264 medium or X265 very fast um, and give significantly better uh, speed quality trade-offs than any of the other encoders that we discussed here. And that for AV1, we're not quite there yet, but we're very close as well. So what does this mean for... Um, longer term thinking, for example, FPGA based encoding. So I ultimately believe that um, software and hardware based encoding approaches are very much complementary. That is, if we want to test um, new encoding approaches or algorithms that improve visual quality and that are compatible with low complexity use cases, we will likely want to test those in software-based encoders first anyway. 
And what we demonstrate here is that they are compatible with low complexity encoding, and therefore those will ultimately be, use, ultimately be useful for uh, hardware-based encoders as well. Uh, some people care a lot about low, low latency uh, use cases. And again, there's a lot of synergism between the work that I've shown here and low latency use cases, because ultimately you will need low complexity encoding um, in, both, uh, in both types of encoding. And so there's a ton of synergism between the two, but we'll leave that for another talk. So um, I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have them. You can also email me. My email address is there on the screen. And thank you for your time. And we're back, and I'm joined with Ronald from Two Orioles. Hi, Ronald. How's it going? Hey, Adarsh. How are you? Doing well. Great to meet you. Um, let's kick it off to the Q&A session. I think the last one taught me that we got to get through the questions because otherwise we're running out of time again. Uh, the first one is kind of open-ended. I think it's really how fast is the encoder, uh, speaking to AV1 or VP9 or both? Right. So. Um... The, the AV1 encoders that people are typically using or that we're talking about, they are, um, like mentioned in the presentation, a fair bit slower than uh, those of previous uh, generations, right? So 264, um, 265 or the VP9 encoder. We talk about those encoders, um, you can pretty easily in a multi-threaded configuration get to real-time 1080p encoding. For AV1, um, I don't think any of the encoders are quite there yet. Uh, but our encoder is getting there. And if you follow the development of SVT, AV1, they are definitely getting there too. Um, there's other companies out there that are working on this too. And they're basically saying the same thing. We're, we're getting there. So um, we're getting to real-time speeds and much faster. And uh, that's a requirement, right? I mean, if you want to cover your use cases, be that uh, high-end content or uh, UGC, UGC style uh, at scale encoding, you need to have really high quality um, at any cost, but you also need to be really fast and uh, low cost for the use cases where that's applicable. And uh, we're definitely getting there. Awesome. Um, the one next one just came in. Um, so for the VMAF and PSNR evaluations that you just showed, were the same bit streams used or were did you use a dash dash tune PSNR for PSNR and then you know the VMAF one for the VMAF graph. Right, so uh, we typically do use tune PSNR um, for, for most of these encodings. Um, there, there's a couple of reasons for that. So uh, I think the most pragmatic way to look at that is that if you use an encoder um, like ours or like X264, X265, the PSNR score will be substantially different, better, uh, if you use Tune PSNR, then um, if you do not. And so um, it's a fair question on which one you should use at that point. Um, and we just choose to use the one that gives the higher score. Um, and so that's the one uh, that gets generated when you use Tunis, uh, Tunis PSNR. And that's the case uh, for, I think, all of the graphs, basically. Uh, there are uh, there are certain um, visual tuning aspects that are disabled in these bit streams, and if you think about that, it's basically those that are typically incompatible with um, uh, with with the metrics that are used there, right? And so um, um, examples of that are um, things that introduce uh, sort of high frequency uh, comfort noise that we uh, tend to attribute with. Um, texture like, like like grass or or things like that but also just films like things like uh, film grain synthesis right uh, if you include film grain your metrics will be destroyed but visually it clearly looks better so um, those are turned off uh, for metric purposes but uh, they will be enabled when you actually encode uh, one for visual analysis got it um, next question is about memory consumption. So what's the memory consumption for Eve? And follow up is, is that a concern in any way at scale when compared with, for example, libvpx or libaom? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, so uh, memory consumption is uh, not that different. I and 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 I don't have exact numbers here, but you should think of it as basically in the same ballpark, maybe 10% lower, 10% higher, depending on 
uh, you know, your exact uh, encoding configuration. Uh, most of the memory consumption in a video encoder will be, uh, you know, partially from, from things that the encoder keeps in cache, but especially at high resolutions, it will be by and large reference frames and the look ahead queue and the weight control and things like that. And those are things that all encoders have. And um, there's not really much that can be done about that, right? I mean, we need those frames in memory to be able to create motion vectors against. So it's not like we can not have them. And that's why um, once you get to the limit of um, it not being pathologically bad, uh, that most encoders tend to use roughly the same amount of memory. And um, so that's what we're sort of trying to optimize for. And I think that's where most of the encoders, including ours, are. And we're not trying to optimize further for the simple reason that uh, at some point you need these frames in memory and there's not much you can do about it. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. Uh, this, this next one I think may have been referred to already in one of the slides, but I figure I'll still ask it anyways, and you can then either take it or build on it. But the question is, how should we be thinking about Eve in the context of live? Are there specific challenges or opportunities for low latency and uh, live linear channels? Right, yeah, so I did mention that in my final slides, I think. Um, at the end, there are a couple of uh, special challenges to live, right? So um, one of them is um, you typically, when you think about live, you think concurrently about low latency. Uh, and that means that uh, frame ordering uh, works very different uh, from the VOD uh, standard use case. Uh, and then secondly, uh, because live implies real time, um, you need to think of the worst case scenarios, right? What, what if um, everything in the encoder goes um, wrong or as bad as it could go? Um, and you end up in a situation where the frame just doesn't finish encoding in time. How do you deal with that? Do you put deadlines in place? Do you put shortcuts in place to, to catch those situations? And so those are sort of the two typical challenges that real-time encoders have to deal with in addition to you know, it actually being uh, real-time uh, and, and, and low complexity already anyway. Uh, and we're, we're currently primarily working on the low complexity aspect of that, uh, but we're, we have started thinking about uh, the low latency um, as well as the um, deadline guarantees uh, and things like that also. Uh, and as this uh, becomes more relevant, that we'll, we will implement that. All right, I think we have time just for one more. Um, so the last question here we'll ask is, is the comparison with VBR constant queue encoding mode? Also, uh, is the, the speed measured with a single thread? Sorry. That, that's OK. All the speeds measured were single threaded, um, right? And so uh, most of the encoders, when you throw multiple threads at it, uh, it will just speed up by almost 2x. Uh, LibBOM tends to scale maybe a little bit uh, less with multi-threading than the other encoders, but the difference is, is not that big. Um, uh, all, the, all the comparisons were done at CQF. Uh, the VBR versus CQF difference in terms of quality bit rates uh, tends to be small. Uh, that is the VBR configuration, at least in LibAOM, as well as in our encoder, um, is, tends to be quite good and they tend to correlate uh, very closely. I have not looked at the VPR implementation in SVTA v1, so I can't comment on that one. All right, and that is all the time we have for Q and A. Thank you once again, Ronald, for joining us and taking all those great questions. Um, any last words? Just thank you for having me. Uh, I really enjoyed all the talk so far, and I look forward to the next ones. Absolutely, and you feel free to check the uh, comment thread if there are any more that we didn't get to. Uh, you can feel free to answer them in line there. Up next, we have our our last talk of the day, which is three speakers. We have Nader, Amir, and Hassan from Intel, who are going to talk about new developments in SVT AV1 encoding on VODs applications. <laughs>